We will give you our pick. I guess it's my pick for the Super Bowl here on Friday's episode. Run through it. Numbers, betting trends, storylines, and then the pick. Okay, we start with some of the numbers. There's a million that we could sift through here. I know I've done that before with some of the other stuff. I think it's kind of simple. Uh, This is the first time both teams are 16-3 and for obvious reasons, the extra game, but both 546 points. Uh, That just proves a point, which I think we already know. Uh, I don't know how often we get it this good. Where it's like, yep, these are the two best teams. I know Buffalo a little disappointing, Cincinnati right in there with it, but Philadelphia, as far as the NFC is concerned, you know, although San Francisco had an incredible run of defense, but without the quarterback, we get it right. Um, the ESPN model, some of that stuff, the project, the predicting stuff, it's all like really, really close. They have it at fifty-two percent for Kansas City, obviously forty-eight for Philadelphia. Uh, Mahomes in the playoffs, seventy percent completion rate right now. 521 yards is two games, and he's clean on the interceptions, which is something that if you were going to pick on Mahomes and go, you know, does he get a little loose? Is his carefreeness, these amazing plays, is that getting in the way? Well, it hasn't gotten in the way so far. So uh, Philadelphia on the other side, we know the dominant defensive numbers. Uh, they have some points per drive stuff defensively, and you compare that to Kansas City's points per drive allowed, which I think is a pretty good metric. They're They're like – way ahead of Kansas City, which is not surprising. You know, Kansas City's statistical profile isn't all that great on the defensive side of things. There is one thing that is bugging me a bit when I was trying to pick this game, because it is pretty close, and it isn't one of those picks where I go, no, you're totally wrong if you pick the other team than I did. But Philadelphia has had the third easiest schedule, depending on which formula you want to look at. I've seen it fourth easiest. I've seen it 11th easiest, which, you know, I think that was a completely different model. And then when you factor in the playoff part of it, it's a Giants team where it's a really good story, but not in this tier of real Super Bowl contenders. And then you get San Francisco without a quarterback. So you probably can tell where I'm leaning here, but it just it keeps leaking into the thought process of Kansas City being more tested in the better conference, more tested against their playoff opponents. And I just kind of I kind of can't shake that despite um, what I've been looking at from this Eagles defense, because if you really wanted to be strict about it, This Eagles defense checks every box you could possibly want. Um, But (laughs) if you go by average quarterback, like if you factor in all the quarterbacks that they've played this year and combine them all up, you can look at EPA, you can look at the PFF stuff. It would be on average the 24th best quarterback in the NFL. So I think this might be a bit of a wake-up call for the Eagles defense. That's just kind of where I'm going. All right, the betting at open, Kansas City minus 2.5. It swung to Philly minus 2.5. It settled Philly minus 1.5. The total is 50.5. 67% of the money, the public money, is on Kansas City. Um, everybody's betting the over. 73% of the bets are on the over, but only 55% of the money. So that probably tells you, you know, there's just some of the smarter people, you know, the way they track this stuff. There's a gap there between percentage of bets and percentage of money. Not surprising more people are going to pick Mahomes and the Chiefs. Here's some stats that aren't great for the Chiefs. Six quarterbacks have led the league in passing. They're own six in the Super Bowl. Mahomes is the seventh quarterback to lead the league in passing and enter the Super Bowl. Since 2000, NFL MVPs are 0-8 in the Super Bowl. Mahomes won the MVP last night. Now, there have been, I think, 10 MVPs that have won a Super Bowl before. So does it mean anything? Nope, they're just trends. But that's those are two there where you're like, wow, that's that's kind of weird. Um, there's a storyline part of this. And there's a lot of different storylines, but I want to pick and focus on a couple. There's a Mahomes one here that fe- feels very LeBronish. where I know this week I said, you know, look, this is what we do. We compare people, right? To suggest we're supposed to just sit back and watch greatness and never ask questions after the great thing happens. Well, that's kind of what we've been doing for a long time with the sports game, right? So Mahomes at 25 is now in his third Super Bowl. Two and one sounds a hell of a lot better than one and two. And if he's chasing Brady, which I don't know if anybody, like, is anybody going to be chasing Brady? I, that, that resume is impossible. It feels impossible, right? It wasn't like Montana 4 0. It's like Brady won seven of these things. So, how are you going to chase that? But I think that's unfortunately what we'll do to Mahomes throughout his entire career because there's probably an argument to be made that he's more talented than Brady is uh, from some of the physical stuff. But maybe that doesn't speak into all the other stuff with quarterbacking that sometimes we on the outside can struggle with. So, if Mahomes is it two and one, it feels like, okay, he's on the path to at least challenge something that, again, I don't really think can be challenged, but those will at least be the conversations where if he gets off to the one and two start, you're like, all right, a lot of work to do here. And that's just, that's just, I say this a lot, but those are the rules. It's why Elway's never allowed to be brought up in again in, in the, 
the all-time quarterback conversations because the Super Bowl resume isn't good enough, which seems totally unfair because when I'm, I'm sitting around, not like it's every day, thinking about, hey, who really was the best quarterback of all time? It seems impossible to argue against Brady the same way it is against Jordan. Um, but there are other quarterbacks, like Marino, for instance, for the guys that really played the position that you will talk to over the years, you just go, man, Marino doesn't get nearly enough credit. We know it's for one simple reason, and that's because of the Super Bowl resume. And the same can be said of Elway, right? Eagle storylines. You know, we're, we're just a couple years removed from 4-11. and 11. And then prior to that, you had Peterson, who won a Super Bowl, looked like he was the guy, was going to be there forever. Right. Got it. You know, played the position, but also understood coaching at a modern level. Terrific with your quarterbacks. He and Wentz paired. Like, this is all going to work out. Then you have the, like things went well and then they went really bad. And then we had the Nate Sudfield game at the end of that four and 11 season where we all know everybody tanks. But in football, we had a much harder time with it. And then it's happening on national television in front of all of us. And we're like, what's he doing? even though Chris Collinsworth during the broadcast had hinted at the fact that, that Peterson said we're going to get a look at old Nate Sudfeld here because it felt like everybody was on the same page, initiated by the front office, ownership signing off on it, that it's like, look, if we can lose this last game here and have a better chance at a draft pick, like we're okay with it all the time, except I guess when we're watching it and it's the NFL. And so then people are freaking out. It did feel dirty. Like I felt like I know what he's doing. It's not really wrong. This game's meaningless. Who really cares? But I just still felt like I didn't like it because it kind of spit in the face of what this whole this whole thing is, why we keep track of the outcomes. So <laughs> then he gets fired. Like, wait, wasn't this all part of it? No, he gets fired. People are outraged. Um, the Giants were outraged. Felt like they cost them a spot. It's like, don't start one and seven. So Peterson's out. People wanted Howie Roseman out. Wentz is already gone. And you're like, man, this is brutal. They bring in Nick Sirianni. Everybody makes fun of him because of his intro presser. And then here we are again in the Super Bowl. It's just another lesson that in the NFL, I know some franchises would be like, that's not true, but it is true. In the NFL, it's actually not that far away if you can make the right decisions. Um, yes, there are a few franchises that would say, well, you know, that doesn't really seem to work for us every 20 years, but this turnaround is great. And then the Jalen Hurts part of this, where Hurts, you know, his story at Alabama is an incredible one. Loses the national championship on that last drive to Deshaun Watson. It was back and forth. It looked like Hurts was going to have the game winning play for a national championship at this young age. He gets benched in the title game against Georgia in 17. And you kind of got it because they felt like Tua was more dynamic and gave them a little bit more than Hurts did. And here's Hurts. You're like, wait, this guy's going to lose a starting gig. He comes back that next year. And I think one of the most poetic parts of the Hurt story was that when he came in for Tua, when he got hurt in the SEC championship game down in the fourth quarter, they were down 28-21, and then Hurts gets a chance to come back and lead that comeback. I thought that was just awesome for him because Hurts, no matter what, has handled himself as professional as probably anybody at this position. He just carries himself a certain way. And yeah, he moved on to Oklahoma and everything worked out, but you still didn't quite know what you had, except for the very worst with Hurts is you had an all-time adult. And now he becomes somebody that I would think even the Eagles weren't quite sure about. I'm not sure Eagles fans were quite sure about. If he were to able to pull this off, like when you think about when you're at your absolute lows, uh, not for us as non-athletes, but you get the point. Like as athletes, all the stuff you go through, all of it is played out in the public. And for him to get benched in the national championship game, have a taste of it, coming back that next year in for two, ironically, transferring out to Oklahoma, putting up huge numbers, but still not sure of him as a, as a drafted quarterback to this. Uh, he's deserving of it. That's for sure. So it's a really tough guy to root against. Uh, one last thing on some of the storyline parts of this, because I have one other thing that is also part of my formula of liking this, uh, this Chiefs pick. There you go. Big tease there. When they got smoked by Tampa 31 to 9, uh, it was it was pretty evident clearly with the offensive line issues that were like okay this is going to be ugly. And this is a bit like my Spurs love of the early Duncan years where I think I just was like I'm picking the Spurs again this year whatever. You know, some years it's going to work out, sometimes it's not. And that's how I feel like I'm going with Mahomes where I'm just going to pick him in all the Super Bowls. Not real scientific, not a lot of depth to it, can read a lot of stuff, probably irrelevant in the overall decision. But in that game against Tampa, what frustrated me was, okay, you've got these three backup O-linemen in there who none of them are even on the roster anymore. Uh, 
how could you have not figured out at some point, like, we don't have time to throw. We need to do something different. If there's a chance today, or excuse me, on Sunday, where against this 10-man defensive line rotation, and that's what the Eagles are throwing at you, which feels like an SEC team, like that's killed it in recruiting for five straight years. doesn't really happen a lot in the NFL. That is there any part, maybe I'm reaching, maybe it's not even a factor at all, but is there any part of it's like, hey, if things start going south on our protection, you know, let's not just punt on the idea for three hours that we can't do something a little bit different. And I do think that Kansas City without Ty- Tyree Kill has been forced to try to find something in the middle against um, against teams and maybe specifically in this matchup against the Eagles linebackers and how they would, would figure that out with personnel, how they might change up some of those things. I just, that Tampa game was such a punt, like immediately you're like, all right, this isn't going to work out. And he's dropping back a million times running for his life. So if pressure is an issue, I'd have to think that that game is at least part of the game planning, making sure we can't let that happen again. But also the talent in the offensive line is so much better now than it was then. Okay, so that's the pick. It's Kansas City getting the point and a half. It's all about Mahomes for me, uh, the advantage there. I'm scared to death about the Kansas City defense, but I did feel like against Cincinnati when they really had to show up, uh, something I've been mentioning here, uh, that was huge because it really felt like when Burrow converted that third and 16, you know, I don't know how you felt when you were watching the game, and I'm watching it, I'm like, oh, they're going to figure this out. They're going to move the ball on these guys. They got them to punt twice late. So can they do enough of that? Can Mahomes figure out what Philly's trying to do defensively? And if it does go south, can they make an adjustment out of it quicker than they did two years ago? Where really, I don't know what much of the adjustment was when they had the lack of personnel, which has been much improved. So Kansas City plus the one and a half. 